I am Michael Sohigian. I am the current president of the Beverly Hills Bar Association, and I want to thank you all for uh, joining us for what it promises to be a fascinating program uh, on uh, escaping the perjury trap, um, the Michael Flynn case uh, and its implications. Um, you uh, should have gotten materials. Also, if you look in the chat, you will find probably um, a message giving you a link to the materials for this program. There it is. Uh, and um, in those materials, you will find uh, also some information about membership in the Beverly Hills Bar Association. Um, uh, I am a member of the Beverly Hills Bar Association, and our other panelists are, I think, with the exception, perhaps, of Professor Levinson, but uh, membership is uh, really worthwhile, and I think after you hear from some of our panelists, you will agree with me that the Beverly Hills Bar Association has some of the highest quality, uh, most competent, uh, and um, skilled lawyers in uh, California, and you'll want to hear more from them. So. We have updated our membership model, uh, and it gives a lot more flexibility uh, and choices. This is uh, the best time, if you're not already a member, to join BHBA, uh, and you'll see those uh, materials in your, uh, your, your materials for the program. Um, so our, our panelists are, uh, as I say, really top folks. Uh, we have Vince Farhat, who is a partner in uh, the, what we call Jeffrey Mangles. Um, uh, they got a couple more people in the, in the title, but uh, we just call it Jeffrey Mangles. Um, Los Angeles office, he's the chair of the firm's white collar defense and investigations group. Um, he was an assistant United States attorney uh, in the major fraud section here in the central district, I presume, right, Vince? Yes. yes. Um, and uh, he was, uh, the criminal health care fraud coordinator for the U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, and uh, as I say, now he is um, uh, the uh, head of the white collar uh, practice at Jeffrey Mangles. We have Richard Kaplan, who is a former president of the Beverly Hills Bar Association uh, and is a private criminal defense attorney uh, with more than uh, 30 years uh, of experience. Um, he's tried cases in state and federal court. Uh, he handles all types of criminal cases from misdemeanors to complex white collar matters. Um, and um, he uh, is a member of the uh, central uh, district uh, court uh, for the federal courts as, a as, a, as a, in addition to the California State Bar, central, eastern, northern, and southern districts of California, and admitted to practice before the United States Supreme Court. Uh, we have Dimitri Gorin, who is currently a partner in Eisner Gorin, LLP, a boutique uh, law firm specializing in criminal defense here in Los Angeles. Uh, he was a deputy district attorney uh, in uh, the county of LA for 10 years before that. Um, and he's got uh, approximately 100 jury trials under his belt. Um, he also serves as an adjunct professor at Pepperdine uh, and UCLA. And then finally, uh, we have Professor Lori Levinson, the David W. Burcham Chair in Ethical Advocacy at Loyola Law School, where she teaches evidence, ethics, criminal law, criminal procedure, white collar crime, not how to commit it, I don't think, right, Professor? Not a how-to course. All right. And trial advocacy. She's the author of numerous books and articles. Um, she is uh, an alumna of Stanford University and UCLA Law School uh, and clerked for the Honorable James Hunter, uh, the third of the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, uh, and also, like Vince, is a former AUSA uh, in the Central District. Um, so, without any further ado, uh, I, uh, oh, also you will see in your materials that a lot of the documents that we talk about um, are, uh, are there. Um, so feel free to study those things. Um, either during this program or afterwards, and we hope uh, that you get the most out of it. Um, we're starting with uh, a discussion of the, of the plea process. Um, 
both in federal courts, which Vince will handle, and then in the state courts, uh, and we'll hear from Rick about that. So please, go ahead. Well, thank you. So we, yeah, we thought it would be helpful to start the program by talking about the basic standards in federal and state court, comparing and contrasting those as a backdrop for the discussion of the Flynn case. You know, in the federal system, the Supreme Court has described uh, it, uh, our federal criminal system as a system of pleas, not a system of trials. You know, the Sentencing Commission has found that 97.6% of federal criminal convictions are obtained through plea bargains. Um, fewer than 3% of cases go to trial in the federal system. So we really are a system of, of, of pleas. What is the standard in federal court? It's governed by Rule 11 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. Rule 11B in particular sets out the standard for the court to consider and accept a guilty plea. Um, the, the Rule 11 requires the court to take four basic steps in considering a guilty plea. First, the court has to address the defendant personally in open court. That's right there in the rule. It has to be in, in open court, and the court has to address the defendant personally. Oftentimes, the defendant is also placed under oath. The second thing is the judge has to advise the defendants of the rights that he or she is giving up by pleading guilty. Um, also, the nature and extent of the charges has to explain any statutory maximum penalties, any mandatory minimums, has to discuss any appeal waivers that might be included in the plea agreement. The third thing is that the court has to, following its, its conversation with the defendant in what we call the Rule 11 plea colloquy, colloquy, has to determine that the plea is voluntary and not the result of force, threats, or promises, other than any promises that might have been made in a plea agreement that was before the court. And lastly, and equally important, the court has to determine that there is a factual basis for the plea. Now, in our district, here in the Central District of California, we have a, a long tradition of having a plea agreements that are very, very long, very detailed, uh, much longer than in some other districts, uh, akin to a phone book, uh, that really cover, are intended to cover every aspect of the Rule 11 colloquy. Um, they're typically signed and filed in advance of the change of plea hearing, and they're really structured to track the Rule 11 colloquy. The basic elements in our district are, first, there's a nature of the offense section, which is a section that describes the elements of the offense uh, or the offenses that the defendant's proposing to plead guilty to. There's a section that discusses penalties and restitution, um, and it has to include a discussion of statutory maximum penalties, restitution, and the like. There's a factual basis. Now, sometimes this is embedded in the sort of the four corners of the document, or sometimes it's an appendix. Uh, attached to the uh, plea agreement, but the factual basis lays out, in some cases, in some very extensive detail, um, the facts that the government believes it could prove if the case went beyond, uh, if, if, if they took the case to trial uh, and could prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Most importantly, there has to be sufficient facts to cover the elements of the offense. There's typically a discussion of sentencing factors and the advisory sentencing guidelines, and if there are agreements, uh, between the government and the defense as to any of those advisory guideline calculations, they're included there. There is typically a section including a waiver of constitutional rights, and that's something that we'll talk about with respect to the Flynn case because there were waivers in that plea agreement. And it really is full disclosure of essentially all the rights the defendant is giving up. And here in this district, it's basically everything, uh, including the right to pursue affirmative defenses, Fourth Amendment claims, Fifth Amendment claims, and the like. Uh, most plea agreements in this district include a waiver of appeal of conviction, limited mutual waivers of appeal of the sentence, um, and then there is a series of provisions that talk about the consequences. What happens uh, if the defendant seeks to withdraw the guilty plea? What happens if there's a breach of the agreement? And again, these sorts of policies are at issue in the Flynn case, and the answer is all bets are off if there's a breach or if there's a request to withdraw the guilty plea. The plea agreement also explains that the court and the probation office are not parties to the plea agreement. Now, there are very limited circumstances under Rule 11C where there can be a so-called binding plea agreement, but for the most part, plea agreements are not binding on the court, and there's a discussion in the plea agreement uh, that talks about that. There's typically an integration clause that makes it clear that there's no additional agreements in the plea agreement, 
um, and a, uh, a statement that that plea agreement is going to be made part of the guilty plea hearing. Now, just in the last five, six, seven years, there's also been an addition of the plea agreement. When I was in the office, it, it, it wasn't included, although it was typically embedded in other provisions. But now, uh, in plea agreements in this district, there's what's called a certification of the defendant. The defendant has to file a certificate, sign a certification, and so does his or her attorney. The certification of the defendant is designed to reinforce the, at least the indicia that the plea is knowing, voluntary, and intelligent. So the things that, that, that a defendant is asked to certify is that he or she has had enough time to review the plea agreement, consider it, discuss it with the attorney. That they understand the terms and agree to the terms, that no promises or inducements or representations have been made other than what's in the plea agreement, that they're satisfied with their attorney, uh, and that they're pleading guilty, and these are the words that are typically included, quote, because I am guilty of the charge and wish to take advantage of the promises set forth in this agreement and not for any other reason. So that plea agreement gets filed with the court, and then we have the change of plea hearing. Uh, the interesting thing about these hearings uh, is that it's the court that runs this hearing, not the prosecutor, but the court. Uh, they run the guilty plea hearing uh, from start to finish. The defendant is typically placed under oath, although that's actually not required uh, under Rule 11. Um, under Rule uh, 11C2, the terms of the plea agreement are made part of the record. Um, and then what will the court will do, and again, the judge's practices will vary, but typically they'll have the assistant U.S. attorney read key sections of the plea agreement into the record, including the factual basis. The court will then question the defendant to confirm his or her understanding of what was read. You know, do you understand this? Do you agree? Did you do the things that have been alleged? Um, the judge confirms on the record that the defendant understands that the court's not a party to the agreement. The judge confirms on the record that the defendant understands that the court could sentence the defendant up to the statutory maximum. And then the judge goes over that certification that I mentioned, uh, typically having it read into the record and making sure that that's their signature. Um, at the end of this, the court has to make findings, the findings required under Rule 11. And it's interesting, and you know, representing clients and guilty pleas, they'll sometimes walk out of there and the client will react and say, I, I thought that the judge was trying to talk me out of it talk me out of pleading guilty, because some of these guilty plea colloquies are very, very thorough. Some of the judges in our district will spend over an hour just on a single, single count plea agreement. Um, one thing, of course, that's an issue in the Flynn case is what's the standard for withdrawing a guilty plea before sentencing? And again, the general standard in federal court is set forth in Rule 11. Uh, and that's a defendant may withdraw a plea of guilty before sentencing if the defendant, and these are the kind of the magic words, a defendant can show a fair and just reason for requesting the withdrawal. Now that's the language. Now, what have courts, uh, at least in the Ninth Circuit said, are fair and just reasons? Well, uh, for example, an inadequate Rule 11 plea colloquy, um, newly discovered evidence, intervening circumstances, erroneous or inadequate legal advice, um, uh, uh, conflicts of counsel, things like that. Um, and, and again, the, at least the, the rule is such that it's a, a fairly liberal standard. How is it reviewed? Well, a district court uh, has the sole discretion uh, to, to determine whether to accept a withdrawal of guilty plea. Here in the Ninth Circuit, that's reviewed for abuse of discretion. Factual findings are reviewed for clear error. Now, here in the Flynn case, in the brief that was filed today with the district court, for the first time, we've seen a sort of a clear statement of, the, of, of General Flynn's position regarding his guilty plea. And he contends uh, that there were flagrant Rule 11 violations. Uh, he contends that the first judge that took the plea um, had alleged conflicts of interest. They make an allegation that Judge Sullivan uh, did not ask whether there were any additional promises or threats that were made to Flynn. He alleges in his filing today uh, that the court accepted his guilty plea, notwithstanding uh, undisclosed conflicts of interest by his counsel. Uh, and he makes an argument that there was significant Brady issues. So we'll discuss that later on in the program, but that's how they're trying to connect uh, the Rule 11 standard with their filing. One question that comes up, uh, and it is an issue in this case, is whether material impeachment evidence can be waived. Uh, in taking a guilty plea? And the answer is, at least constitutionally, yes. In the case of United States versus Ruiz in 2002, the U.S. Supreme Court, in a 9-0 uh, opinion, 
it was delivered by Justice Breyer, uh, held that the Constitution doesn't require the government to disclose material impeachment evidence prior to entering the plea agreement with the criminal defendant. There were a number of reasons enunciated by the court, including uh, Justice Breyer's comment that requiring disclosure of the evidence would improperly force the government to engage in substantial trial preparation before plea bargaining. Now, the ruling of that, uh, of that holding in Ruiz is actually limited to material impeachment evidence, but the Department of Justice has taken a broad view of Ruiz um, in the Justice Manual, which is formally called the U.S. Attorney's Manual. Um, the government broadly construes um, uh, Ruiz as barring mandatory disclosure of just about all exculpatory evidence. If you look at section 9-5001B, uh, the government states, the, the Department of Justice states that neither the Constitution nor this policy, meaning the Justice Manual, creates a general discovery right for trial preparation or plea negotiations. And that's the government's position. Um, in the Flynn case, uh, there was a waiver. The plea agreement includes a provision that states, quote, your client agrees to waive all rights, whether asserted directly or by a representative, to request or receive from any department or agency of the U.S. any records pertaining to the investigation or prosecution of the case, including without limitation FOIA records and things like that, for the entire duration of the special counsel's investigation. So the plea agreement here in the Flynn case does include a waiver. Um, it doesn't necessarily mention Brady by, by, by name, but it clearly it appears to apply to requests for exculpatory records. So that's the basic standard in federal court because it's a very thorough process. It's very difficult to unwind guilty pleas and we'll see what uh, Judge Sullivan does in the Flynn case. All right, I guess I'll take it from here uh, on state court, which is, you know, the same basic constitutional standards are gonna apply with state court. I'm gonna try to keep this brief because I really think the Flynn discussion is kind of what we uh, want to address today. But, you know, the, I tell people who have a lot of federal practitioners who haven't done a lot of criminal work in state court, state court's a lot more the Wild West. And, and it's very different in a lot of ways. Um, first of all, if you're talking in a misdemeanor courtroom where they are uh, resolving 30, 40, 50 cases a day, you know, the, there is no colloquy. The judge is not confirming uh, the guilt or, or you know, the, the factual basis other than is there a stipulation to a factual basis. Um, and so that's, that's really one of the bigger differences. Um, and, and even in, in um, fe felony cases, the pleas are fairly quick. Um, in most misdemeanor cases, 90% probably or more, there's written waivers. You're doing your Boykin Tall waivers that are going over the consequences, um, what, what's happening with the plea, immigration consequences, which has always now become a big deal since Padilla. Um, and that's also with um, felony cases. But I'd say the probably the single biggest difference with state court is the no contest plea. Um, in federal court, it's the Alford plea, which you don't see much and courts generally don't accept. And basically that's acknowledging that people plead guilty at times when they're in fact not guilty. Um, now we don't see that so much in federal court, but I know in one of the briefs filed, uh, amicus brief by NECDL, they kind of brought that issue up that there are people pleading guilty that do not, you know, that were not guilty, but they're doing it for other reasons. And basically, in state court, we call it a people v. West plea. And it basically, people are taking a plea because they feel it's in their best interest. They're, they're entering the plea, looking at the evidence, saying, maybe I could be convicted, maybe I won't, but they made me an offer I can't refuse. I can walk away. You know, maybe you're charged with multiple felony counts, and they offer you, you know, a misdemeanor, uh, no time, and you can, call, you can get out of something. And so people are just taking these no contest pleas and these are accepted regularly in state court without a question of the factual basis. And there are times the court always asks the attorneys, do you stipulate to a factual basis based upon the police reports or the transcripts of a preliminary hearing? Um, and a lot of times you'll hear, you know, judges, uh, lawyers will say, we stipulate based upon people be West. My client's doing this because he feels it's in his best interest. 
and those are regularly accepted. Um, now, when we come back, you know, to the situations when somebody wants to withdraw that plea, you know, that's, you know, we, it's codified in uh, Penal Code Section uh, 1018, um, where people, anytime within six months of entry of any plea, when probation is granted, um, the court can permit the withdrawal of a plea for good cause. Um, they can also, if a, a uh, litigant, a defendant was unrepresented at the time of the plea, and they come back and want to withdraw, it's almost, it's pretty much automatic. The court's going to allow um, an unrepresented defendant to withdraw the plea if they change their mind or if they come in with an, an attorney and say they just didn't understand what was happening. Now, usually, and you'll see when there's an unrepresented person in, in some cases, the courts are going to take a little bit longer to talk them through the plea. But, you know, in a misdemeanor courtroom, you know, when they're busy and then God knows what it's going to be like when we go back after COVID with these cases. I mean, I'm told there's 1,400 jury trials backed up in L.A. County Superior Court right now. Um, they're going to be moving things and it's at a rocket pace. And so people aren't always going to be clear as to uh, you know what occurred. Now, the definition of basically good cause to withdraw a plea generally is they must de demonstrate they were operating uh, under mistake, ignorance, or any other factor overcoming the exercise of his or her free judgment, including fraud or duress. Um, you know, the first one that always comes to mind is my lawyer didn't advise me correctly. My lawyer didn't tell me consequences, and this gets into Padilla. You know, prior, a few years ago, prior to codifying Padilla, you know, were people advised properly um, on the immigration consequences? Because there's so many cases that, you know, people think it's a little misdemeanor, I'm going to get no time, but if it's got moral turpitude, you know, immigration court is going to find that as um, something that could make somebody deportable. Um, so that's really important. And it puts a different obligation since Padilla on defense lawyers on, you know, what our obligation is and talking to our client and advising them, you know, on a, certainly any felony case, you, you, either we have to do our own independent research or advise a defendant, um, you know, uh, to a, talk to an immigration attorney before taking a deal. And, you know, you see in state court that it becomes very complicated because people decide what's the risk, you know, when they're looking at felonies that have, you know, and, um, determinate sentences where they could be doing three, four, five years in state prison, all of a sudden they're getting a probation offer, you know, they'll risk immigration to walk out of court that day. And that's a lot of times, you know, then a month, you know, two years later when their deportation proceedings begin, then they come back and say, I wasn't advised. So that's something that we need to be aware of. Um, you know, if just failure to advise the constitutional rights in some counties where they don't have um, court reporters and they don't always use written waivers, there's an issue of what were, was the person advised at the time of the plea. Um, you know, if there's a, you know, a, a violation of a plea bargain, that's the other difference, I'd say, the big difference between state and federal court. Judges do get involved a lot of times in the, in the plea bargaining process, where we will go back into chambers, and the judge may lean on a prosecutor and listen to the facts of the case and kind of say, you know what? I don't think it's worth what you're offering. I think you should maybe do this. And they put some pressure on the DAs. And a lot of times DAs will listen to you know, these judges that are, you know, they're trying to move their calendars. They're also advising, hey, this is a defensible case. You should reconsider your position. Um, you know, the 11 C1C plea that um, Vince talked about, that's like the binding plea in federal court. In state court, you know, you usually agree upon a number with the DA. You know, it's not as often that you come in and say, judge, we've agreed to, a, unless you do an open plea to the court, you know, we agree on a range, you can do that, or you can agree on, you know, clients looking at whatever number, and you say, okay, it's worth two years. How are we going to get there? And this is what we're going to plea, you tell the judge. Now, the judge can reject that plea, but if not, it's done. So it's not, it takes a lot of that discretion away from some of the judges in plea bargaining. While they do have to approve the plea bargain, um, it, it, you know, they're not there to making that determination of, you know, two, three, four, five, six years, um, or depending, you know, whatever may be the uh, range. And again, you know, we see charges dismissed and all of that. Um, 
Hey, Richard, can, obviously, can I ask a quick question of you guys? Uh, how often have you seen uh, in state court, and then I'll go to Vince, defendants actually try to withdraw a plea? In other words, put it in the context for all the listeners. How many cases resolved by way of plea bargain? And then how often does a defendant then come back and try to do what Flynn is doing, which is to try to withdraw his plea? I'd say, you know, I think state, we have a little, not quite 97, probably 95, maybe close to 90, you know, 95% are plea bargains. And very rarely do you see defendants come back. And if you just, and especially if you cut out that Padilla immigration group that kind of get forced into it, you know, they're in deportation proceedings and this is their last Hail Mary. Those people are, you see those a little more regularly, but short of that, it's very rare to see someone come in and, and move to, uh, withdraw their plea. And so it's just not very, you know, often, although there is people be Ramirez where it said, you know, evidence that the prosecution withheld that's favorable to the defendant um, could render a plea involuntary. So there is case law on that, um, that, you know, if they withhold, you know, and again, you know, that's California law, you know, potentially exculpatory evidence and don't tell them and, that, and it comes out that could, and it's not does, but it could render a plea involuntary. So it's pretty rare. Um, so that, it's that's going to depend upon, you know, you know, was the lawyer doing their job, you know, competently representing the person and done the proper research. Go ahead, Dimitri. Yeah, so I was just going to say, it's pretty rare, right, from my experience in court and your experience in court, and I'll ask Vince next, that a defendant who actually takes a plea because they want to resolve the case, then come back, comes back to try to say, no, 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 I want to have my trial now, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's been my experience as well. You know, like I was saying before, only, you know, I don't know, 2.4% of federal cases go to trial. Uh, the vast majority resolved by way of a plea agreement. Where I've seen motions for a withdrawal of guilty plea has been where there have been collateral consequences, like a Padilla situation, where someone seeks to unwind the plea on the, on the argument that they weren't properly advised by their attorney, by the court of the potential collateral consequences. Uh, I, but I've only seen it in a handful of occasions in my experience as both a prosecutor and a defense attorney. Yeah, I know as a DA and a defense lawyer for me, I've only in the 25 years, I've seen three instances of a defendant after taking a plea, trying to withdraw their plea. Richard, how many times have you actually witnessed that in your cases that a client wants to withdraw the plea after you know, you've advised them they took the plea? In other words, this Flint situation is very rare, very rare is the point I'm making, right? Absolutely. It is rare. I mean, I've had clients come to me and, and usually the withdrawal of the plea is more like because of the advice they received from their lawyer. That's probably the most common one that I see coming in is, you know, they just weren't advised. They didn't know specific consequences. They felt they were rushed into it. Um, and, you know, the, the, the tough part of state court, I think more than anything is, the people who plea to get out of custody, you know, they are pressured. And that is, you know, that's the duress argument you see is someone's in custody. They can't afford that $50,000 bail. But if you plead, you get out today. You know, that was a win. The people plead, they get out. And then they're like, I never should have played. Right. right. Hey, Rick, I had a question. In your experience, since you work with no contest pleas or alpha pleas, which are very rare in the federal system, do you see any difference between um, someone pled, you know, actually pled to the felony versus just no contest, um, a difference in the rate in which people might seek to withdraw the pleas and the court's uh, rate of granting those requests? I, I'm not sure on that. I would say the no contest pleas are probably more likely to come through because when people do plead guilty, but that, that, you know, if a court will allow my client to plead no contest, we're always going to do that. It's just, that's a habit. I mean, you're not going to have a client plead guilty except for very limited situations. And there are occasions, um, recently I had a vehicular manslaughter. That was part of, you, you got the deal they want because the victim's family wanted a guilty plea. And we got a better deal because of that. I mean, that was part of the negotiation. Those are rare situations. Um, but anytime, you know, there's a possibility of a civil suit, Obviously, the no, the no contest will help us. I mean, the court does say, and it's on the tall waivers, the court will treat a guilty plea, the exact uh, no contest plea, the exact same as a guilty plea, and will find you guilty. Right. That's the language that the court does on every one of those. Let, let me go to Professor Levinson. Professor Levinson, can you 
educate us on this in this area of guilty pleas and what you've observed and uh, instructed both as to state and federal court proceedings? Well, I'd be delighted to. Um, first of all, Vince and uh, Rich, thanks for the great job you did. And I actually want to correct something just to start out, because I'm going to talk about this guy, Michael <laughs> Flynn, and how it relates to this whole topic. And what we should all realize is that Actually, he did make a motion to withdraw his plea, but that's not what all the hullabaloo is about. What the hullabaloo is about is the attorney general moving to dismiss the case with, quote, leave of the court when the court is in no mood to give leave of the court after this guy pleads guilty, not just once, but twice with a very detailed plea agreement and plea colloquy and admissions of how it was a false statement in material. So if folks will indulge me, and if you don't know the story of Michael Flynn, let me give you some background on this case. Um, General Flynn, Lieutenant General Flynn, was a decorated officer in Iraq and Afghanistan. And as a reward for that, he actually was a Democrat. And Obama appointed him as the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency back in 2012. But he only lasted a couple of years. And there's some reasons for that that are very relevant. One was he wasn't considered a particularly good leader. Um, people said he was abusive, that he was loose relationship with the truth. They had something called the Flynn facts. He wasn't a good manager. But the other thing that was making the Obama people nervous is that Flynn had a very close tie with the Russians. And they had an informant telling him that not only was Flynn close to, he sat next to Putin at a dinner, but he was close to the Russian military intelligence group. And he had mm, a woman there that uh, he liked to see as well. And that he constantly was asking to go back to Russia for more contact. So after two years, in 2014, the Obama people say, thank you, no thanks, and he retires. And he retires and creates something called the Flynn Intel Group, which is, quote, intelligent services for businesses and governments. And he creates that with his son, Michael G. And what he's doing there is actually making connections with Russians, representing them. He's being a lobbyist. He registers as a lobbyist for the foreign agents, the FARA Act, in which he does that. He's getting paid a half million dollars to represent them, including benefits from the Turkish government. And he's somewhat fed up and upset with the Obama administration. So he decides to move over to the Trump campaign. And in 2016, he gets involved in the Trump campaign. And he sits in on various types of briefings and meets with them at Trump Towers. There is some concern behind the scenes with the FBI and others about a possible conflict of interest. Don't forget that Flynn is uh, involved as a consultant on a US-Russian project to build 40 nuclear reactors in the Middle East. Um, and meanwhile, he's having these meetings with the Trump people. And the uh, intelligence agencies and the FBI know about these because they are monitoring communications with the Russian ambassador, Kislyak. And there are these communications that are going on between Flynn and him. Based on that, they make Flynn and his relationship with the Russians part of uh, her the hurricane crossfire hurricane investigation. And that was the official sort of looking into what's going on with the Russians and the possible impact with the 2016 campaign. And he was being monitored as a result of that. Then you go to the Republican convention. And some of you might remember that Flynn was tagged to do the keynote speech. And it was a fiery speech. He talked about, or tired of Obama's empty speeches, and he was the one who led the chant, lock her up, lock her up. He was also had the Twitter account that spread the whole Pizzagate conspiracy about horrible things happening to children by uh, Hillary Clinton. And so there was a legitimate basis, actually, probably for the FBI to investigate him, and they did exactly that. 
Well, the campaign goes on and the FBI has been doing the investigation and they don't really have any hardcore information that he's doing anything to manipulate the election. And so it looks like they're just going to end it with regard to him. There really is no question, however, that it was at the beginning legitimate to investigate him. Horowitz, who's the inspector general, letter, later verified, excuse me, verified that. All right. Meanwhile, there are communications between uh, Kislyak, let me get you the pictures, the ambassador, and Flynn, including phone calls while Flynn is at Mar-a-Lago. And what happens is, if you'll recall, in December, uh, when the Obama administration feels that they have evidence that the Russians are manipulating or trying to manipulate the election, they go ahead and expel a bunch of Russian agents. And um, they're waiting for a response from Russia that they're gonna expel Americans and it doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen because Flynn contacts uh, Kislyak and says, don't do that. That's not what Trump wants. And we don't wanna have that type of relationship. Now the problem with that folks is that Trump wasn't the president yet. And we have something called the Logan Act that says only the administration that's in power can make foreign power decisions. So that was raising some concerns. And at that point, the FBI, even though they are about to close the case on Flynn, says, well, maybe we should take another look. And that leads them to reopening it. Now, meanwhile, Flynn is appointed by Trump as the national security advisor in January of 2017. Obama's people are telling Trump's people, don't do that. We have concerns about Flynn. Uh, so on June, uh, January 24th, McCabe and the FBI sets up the meeting for his agents to go talk to Flynn. And they don't advise him at the meeting that line to the FBI is a crime. Frankly, they don't have to, and they don't advise most people. Um, he decides not to have a lawyer. He says, I know what I'm doing. I've been dealing with national security, and he sits down and talks to them. The FBI knows perfectly well that he's been in those conversations with the Russian ambassador because they've been listening to the Russian ambassador. And they ask him about them, and he denies them. Or he says things like, I, I don't really remember talking about the tit for tat. At that point, the FBI goes to DOJ officials and say, we got a problem here. Because uh, Flynn has been denying this conversation with Vice President Pence. And now that we have this information, he could be subject to blackmail by the Russians. You got to do something. And Flynn is fired, he resigns after 24 days of being in that position. That leads to that fateful meeting, you remember, between uh, President Trump and Comey in the Oval Office, where the president says, you know, Flynn's a good guy. I hope you can see your way of, quote, letting this go. Well, they don't let go. That part of the investigation gets passed on to this guy, Bob Mueller. And he's now looking at what was going on with Flynn. And they have all sorts of information on Flynn. It's not just a 1001 refers to lying to a federal official. In fact, they have evidence of money laundering, a plot to kidnap a tourist cler cleric, other things, FARA violations. So they make a deal. This is a deal with Flynn. To A, that his son's not going to be charged, and B, that he's going to go out on a single violation and he's going to cooperate. And in fact, he does dozens of interviews with law enforcement. But when it comes to testifying in a particular case involving a guy named Rafikian, he balks. And at that point, things start to fall apart. And instead of what Mueller was initially recommending, which was probably probation. Remember, Flynn could have walked away with probation. They start talking about how he's reneging on the agreement and everyone's getting annoyed and he knows that he's looking at more time. So let me go to that guilty plea part and how that's coming in. Flynn pled guilty not once, but twice. The first time he pled guilty, he pled guilty in front of Judge Contreras. 
And Judge Contreras took the full type of guilty plea, and it was written out, and we actually have a draft of what the guilty plea agreement was before he pled. So he had input. It wasn't just a stamp uh, guilty plea. And he admitted not only did he lie, but he admitted that it was material to an investigation. Then it turns out that Contreras is friends with the FBI agents who had done the interview and where there were some problems of whether they had a bias against Flynn. So he drops out. And a week later, Judge Sullivan is appointed to the case. And Judge Sullivan comes back in and does a very lengthy plea colloquy. And Judge Sullivan, to put it mildly, is a plain spoken guy. And he's saying all sorts of things like, what kind of pressure are they putting on you? And that's where you've heard this whole bit about the treason. They threatened him with treason. It's not so much they threatened him with treason. It was actually Judge Sullivan trying to figure out what's at play in this case, whether I should really accept this guilty plea now that I'm taking on this case. He takes the guilty plea and things are marching towards cooperation and sentencing. But things go bad then and they keep putting off the sentencing. In June of 2019, Flynn fires his Covington lawyers. And instead, he hires this person, Sidney Powell. And if you're not familiar with Sidney Powell, well, she's a lawyer who prides herself with being aligned with what she calls MAGA. She was a Fox News favorite. And uh, she was able to actually get word through Flynn's brother that maybe he should reconsider and withdraw his plea. So she signs him up. And in fact, January 2020, Flynn does that. He moves to withdraw his plea. But that never gets decided. Because at the same time, this guy, Barr, who's our attorney general, assigns the case out to see if there's been shenanigans and investigate the investigators, the FBI. And a guy named Jeff Jenkins does that investigation and comes back with what we've all heard about, the irregularities or what he thinks was improper conduct by the FBI agents in their investigation. Based upon that, the attorney general does something extraordinary. In May 7, 2020, he moves under Rule 48A to move to dismiss the case, right? It's not a withdrawal of a guilty plea. It's moved to dismiss the case. But Rule 48A requires that there be leave of court. So the judge is thinking, we probably need a little bit of a hearing on this. But right now, Flynn's people are aligned with PAR people who don't want anything about this case to be heard. They just want it to go away quickly. So Judge Sullivan appoints former federal judge John Gleason, who is no fan of the administration and says something is not right here, to be what he calls an amicus curiae. Now, I've only heard of amicus curiae in terms of briefs to court, usually appellate courts. But on the D.C. District Court, they use that to appoint lawyers to represent sides that are not having a voice in the courtroom. And recently, Judge Gleason did file an 82-page brief laying out why there was not good cause for the judge to grant the dismissal. Um, the Flynn people have been saying dismissal is just an administrative act. You know what? We asked for it. We get it, and you don't have a right to say no or to even ask questions. And they run up to the D.C. Court of Appeal with something extraordinary, a petition for writ of mandamus. And they say to the D.C. Circuit, take the case away from Sullivan, order that the Rule 48 um, motion be granted, dismiss the case, and treat this as an administrative matter. There was oral argument on that last week. And it was a fascinating oral argument. I was curious because on the panel were two conservative judges and one liberal. And one of the two conservative judges is actually a Trump appointee, Judge Rao. But all of them were very concerned about the idea that Judge Sullivan wouldn't be allowed to do what is the regular course of action. He has a July 16th hearing set to hear whether there is 
that he should grant leave of the court. Like, why are you doing this? Or is it just because this is a friend of the president? Professor Levinson, can you just describe what leave of the court is? Because that's a term of art. So everybody Yeah, knows. no, I wish I could. And so does the court, because that's exactly, and I'm sorry if I was droning on, but well, hopefully you find this as interesting oh, as I am. Uh, leave of the court is exactly one of the issues here. The administration and Sidney Powell, uh, she's really kind of a remarkable lawyer in terms of the language. She's very plain spoken. Uh, for example, in the argument, uh, she was asked, what evidence is there to support that? And she said, quote, well, we've got evidence up the wazoo. Now, I don't know if any of you try that in court, but I wouldn't be trying that in court. One of the key issues here is what is leave of court. The administration is arguing that under separation of powers, only the executive branch has the right to decide not only who is prosecuted, or how, but also how long you continue the prosecution. Judge Gleason has brief for Judge Sullivan that no, no, that language must mean something else. It must mean at minimum that the court has a responsibility since the court took the plea and put the stamp of approval on the plea after the prosecutors got to decide who to prosecute. That leave of the court means that you do need the court to do some examination to make sure there's no corruption in the dismissal. And we're kind of waiting for their decision to decide that. How often, um, how often does it happen? And again, I just want to put it in context where a defendant, and I'm, I'm talking about to Professor Levinson and we'll go with Richard and Vince, that a defendant takes a plea, and we've talked about then uh, withdrawing, but takes a plea, and then the government actually makes a motion to dismiss the, the, the case after the defendant has accepted responsibility twice. How often does that happen? Has, does, I, have I, you ever I, seen that happen? I think the answer is almost never. Yeah. That's what makes this case so rare. Certainly the government sometimes can move to dismiss the case, but not in a situation like this. And that's what's got everyone's eyebrows. And I want to add one other dimension as we open up for discussion. Please. One of the things that Judge Sullivan is looking at is whether there's a perjury here. Don't forget that when Flynn did enter his pleas, twice. He was under oath. And the judge is saying, you know, you lied to me. Now, uh, the Flynn people are saying, you can't be serious about that because what about all those exonerees who pled guilty? Now, folks, I run an innocence project and I didn't really appreciate trying to make that comparison. But one of the issues in this case has become, and I just want to summarize the issues as we get into the discussion. What's at play in this case is things like, is it not material to a, a, a 1001 charge because the underlying investigation had problems or you might not have been able to convict Flynn of something else? That would be a wide change, that, a huge change in that law. All of a sudden, do you defense lawyers have to go out and get discovery about the investigation that stuff under Ruiz that you haven't been able to get in order to enter a plea. Because if now it's a ground to withdraw a plea or move to dismiss a case because there was misconduct, how can you do that without getting that information? And the last thing I want to mention is something that people call perjury trap. Like they, they knew that he would probably lie. And does that invalidate the crime and the plea? Up to now, it has not. But this case has so many twists and turns and we're getting briefs every day, and we don't really know until the D.C. Circuit issues its ruling even what the proceedings will look like before the trial judge. So uh, thank you, Professor Levinson. I know that before we counsel our clients to go talk to the FBI, we make sure <laughs> on that issue of perjury before they even go talk, because you don't want to go in and make statements to the federal government without being sure your client is going to be fully honest and is ready to be fully honest. So the whole perjury trap issue is interesting because most counsel, most criminal defense lawyers will go over, over and over with their client, um, you know, question and answer that they could expect from the FBI. In this instance, Flynn didn't ask for a lawyer and he's a very sophisticated defendant. So on this issue of perjury trap, Vince, how do you guys deal with clients that want to go in and 
you know, and cooperate with the government? How do you prevent the purge trap from happening in your practice? How do you counsel your clients? Well, I mean, having to keep them from making false and misleading statements, although it's not under oath, it's not technically perjury, it's still a federal crime. It's and you have to make sure that they understand that there is no sort of half measure. They either go in and are completely and totally honest and not misleading and not cute in their responses, uh, or they don't go in. Um, you know, in, uh, in federal practice, it's, it's sometimes the case where you can negotiate a proffer agreement, a so-called queen for a day. But even those queen for a day agreements are riddled with exceptions. Although the government can't use the words uh, that your client utters directly against them, they can use them to obtain leads. They can use them against uh, the client or the client subsequently prosecuted. And so it is a very treacherous uh, ground. And to proffer or not to proffer is the question. And it's an art, not a science. I wanted to just mention one thing about Rule 48 dismissals. When I was a prosecutor, I only did it once. And that was a situation where a defendant had pled guilty to defrauding the Social Security government or the Social Security system. Um, I pled guilty, was awaiting sentence, and then tragically passed away. And obviously there was, you know, that mooted the prosecution. And sadly, we had to place the death certificate before the court and ask for a dismissal. I mean, that's the scenario typically. Now, yes, there are very unusual circumstances, and the Flynn briefing does cite some high-profile examples uh, where there's been a subsequent discovery of, of information. We have the, the Enron case and other cases, but they're very, very, very rare. And this case, the Flynn case, is rare on top of rare. Uh, this is really unprecedented. Um, and uh, the separation of powers issues uh, are very interesting to me as someone who does believe in separation of powers, but query whether those arguments are premature because Judge Sullivan hasn't even ruled on the motion. He hasn't even had a hearing on the motion. All he's done is ask for more information in the form of amicus brief. And I think the hesitation that at least I heard uh, and saw when I read the comments from the, from the judges in the, in the DC circuit was about, no pun intended, short circuiting the process. Uh, that at this point, Flynn has a remedy, the government has a remedy, Sullivan has before him a motion that he hasn't yet ruled on, uh, and perhaps it's best for the parties to keep the matter before Judge Sullivan and allow him to rule, and then at that point, move, move forward. I certainly can understand Flynn, you know, swinging for the fences, absolutely, I, you know, but uh, uh, this is a very unusual case, and it does seem to me that it's premature, at least that's an argument or a point that I heard in the questions the judges were asking. We'll see what the circuit does. Demetri, I, go ahead, go ahead. No, I agree with Vince. In the argument, it was really clear that even Judge Rao, the Trump appointee, was concerned that they were short-circuiting and that in fact, that it's something that should go back to the district court, that the Court of Appeals shouldn't weigh in. But I think for Flynn, they want to quote, shut this down. One of the telling points we haven't mentioned yet, when you asked about how regular this is or is not to file this, the career prosecutors on this case quit the case. They basically said we would not be part of this. And, you know, for those of us who've been prosecutors, you can read into that, that they were very unsettled, to say the least, by this extraordinary motion. Richard, have you had a case where uh, the government has moved to dismiss it after your guys entered a guilty plea? After a guilty plea, um, I have not. Um, you know, the one further comment just on the perjury trap, you know, is talk about what do you tell your client is we always tell our clients they know things you have no idea they know. And they are going, they have their key questions. They're setting you up to see if you're being truthful. I mean, and it, in a sense, it is that trap. But, you know, they most of the time they know something that the clients in their mind think they're never going to know it. And that's the question they've got to watch out for the most because it's the least expected one. Um, I, I, I have never seen in 25 years of practice, either as a prosecutor or defense lawyer, when a defendant actually enters a plea and then the government moves to dismiss the case after they have obtained their guilty plea. Because as a prosecutor, you have some very, eth you have some specific ethical duties you must follow. And if you have a doubt over a defendant's guilt or innocence, you're not supposed to be prosecuting that defendant anyway. So some of the, is there stuff in the U.S. Attorney Manual, Vince or Lori, if you know, or Richard, where um, there's some ethical duties on them not to move forward with a case when there's doubt about a defendant's guilt or innocence? Uh, is there any ethical um, 
I, I know the prosecutors in the case quit. Are there any ethical standards that they should be that they should abide by that you can point us to? Well, there certainly are, and I actually see in our par panel participants we have a former U.S. attorney himself, Terry Bowers. Good to see you, and some uh, J Angela, some former AUSAs. Uh, what everyone will tell you is, you know, the standard is actually relatively low under the ethical rules. You just need probable cause to bring a case, but the real standard is that you should be believe that you should you can prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. And so if you have concerns about that, you need to reevaluate whether you're bringing this case. Um, you know, Barr has suggested that he's worried about whether he could, but his basis for that just seems so far-fetched. He's worried that it's not material because it couldn't affect the Russian investigation. But as Judge Gleason points out, of course it affects the investigation. You're asking somebody about their discussion with the Russian ambassador and they're denying it. One way or another, that's going to affect the investigation. Right, right. Uh, I have a question. Oh, Mike, Mike, can I jump in? Sure. Uh, this well, is the I question see your that, face now. You can jump in. That's right. Ta-da. This is a question that uh, puzzled me from the moment that the uh, government's motion was filed. It, it has to do with these concepts. I mean, I'm a civil litigator, so I really don't know anything about it. Um, but it has to do with these concepts of materiality and falsity and whether the position that the government has taken in the motion to dismiss might end up uh, coming back to bite federal prosecutors in the other 999,000 cases um, where uh, defendants are going to say, well, look, you know, you said that uh, Flynn's uh, uh, statements to the FBI were not material to uh, their investigation, so neither is my, neither are my clients. Um, and the issue of falsity, as I understand it, what the what the uh, motion at least said was that a statement that well, you know, I don't really remember, I, I don't I don't recall that I talked to him about that is not provably false. And I I mean I have enough experience in civil litigation to know that nobody ever lies. Everybody says. I don't remember. I don't remember that, even though you know they do. So I, I would seem to me that that uh, good criminal defense lawyers like the three gentlemen we have here today would have a field day with that. Is that a is, is that a possibility, or is this going to just be a one off? And you, AUSAs will get away by saying, "Well, gee, that's what that's what Attorney General Barr said, but that's not what the federal government actually believes in this case." That's well, right. an interesting question. You know, usually materiality in a run of the mill case is really just sort of a check the box. It's the you know, materiality is, is you put the agent on the stand. If you're a prosecutor, it would have affected your, your decision. Yes, it would have. Let's move on. We've seen more debate over materiality in the Civil False Claims Act uh, context uh, after Escobar. But really, materiality in the run-of-the-mill criminal case uh, is not an issue. Whether this represents a change in policy, I certainly, as a defense attorney, um, if I'm faced with a situation, whether pre-indictment in a plea negotiation uh, or after a client's been charged, I'm going to think seriously about my ethical obligations here because the, the United States Attorney General in a high-profile case has said that it was appropriate uh, or that, that, the, that Flynn pled guilty without having received exculpatory evidence. We believe that impacts materiality. We're moving to dismiss the case. That's the, you know, that is the Attorney General's decision. And so uh, I'm sure that line AUSAs will argue that it's not DOJ policy, but there may be situations and contexts where I'm duty bound uh, to advance that argument, either pre-indictment or after my client's been charged and seek discovery, maybe bring what I'll call the Flynn motion um, after an indictment's been returned uh, to seek that information. And, and in the Flynn case, there were multiple Brady motions that were denied. Uh, then there was an investigation, there was information supplied by the government thereafter. And I passed no judgment one way or the other on the Flynn case. I don't know the facts well. But to me, um, as I think about how this affects my practice, um, it is there is a question. Is this a de facto policy change? I'm sure that DOJ will say no. I wouldn't expect a change in the U.S. Attorney's Manual anytime soon. But I think we're going to see a raft of motions beginning uh, this month and going forward particularly in false statement cases where materiality is an element that must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Professor Levinson, do you have anything to add or Richard on that point? I mean, I think the defense of a little lie, if just a little lie, 
you know, it's not a major lie. I mean, what now what's material? I mean, he, he lied. We, you know, there's, it's fairly clear he lied, but they're just saying it wasn't that big a deal. I mean, and so, you know, and now it's going to also be, you know, on cases, I think, juries, you know, that's the thing, the public's perception is going to change as to what's a lie. And what, what used to be a check the box on materiality now may be something you argue to a jury. They've heard of it now. Um, it's been in the press. Maybe it's something you know, you're going to get a juror to. What do you think, Professor Levinson? I agree with Vince. And I think it's already happening. I think that, frankly, for any defense lawyer currently representing anybody who has a 1001, a false statement charge, or something related to that, has to be pausing and making the request for discovery and have, making maybe their own motion to dismiss and, you know, putting the prosecution's feet to the fire. You know, this might have been expeditious for the Department of Justice, for the Attorney General, as it relates to Michael Flynn's case but it does reverberate. And 1001 is one of the most used statutes by federal prosecutors. It's uh, used oftentimes in plea agreements because it's so easy, you know, any lie can form the basis and it doesn't have to be in the grand jury and it doesn't have to be under oath. And it's not just to the benefit of the government, you know, frankly, defendants love using it. So now you have to think about how nervous prosecutors are going to be to make a deal that has just that count that's likely to get a lower sentence range because it's become a much more complicated count now. Right, right, right. So Michael, what else? Did we get your question answered? Any yeah, other? you did. Uh, and I, I have another question because I know you guys do a lot of this work both in state and, and federal. And my very limited experience suggests that juries tend to believe law enforcement. Um, no, no matter what we hear about test lying and all that stuff, in nine cases out of 10, um, it, it, the, the jury is going to believe, and that's especially true, as I understand it, about the FBI. Um, you know, I mean, 25 years of Efren Zimbalist coming into your living room every week um, has put them in the popular mind, I, I think, in the jury's mind, above reproach. And here we have the federal government um, laying out um, and not just in the Flynn case, but for a couple, two and a half, three years before that, um, just laying into the FBI. Um, and um, I just wonder, you guys, of course, are all on the defense side. So I guess that might be good if it has an effect on criminal prosecutions, federal criminal prosecutions going forward. But, you know, again, my, my, uh, my, my view is, and it's like Professor Le Levinson said about uh, uh, in her earlier answer, that it's expeditious for the department to take those positions and to act in this way and to make these arguments with respect to Flynn. But what are the unintended consequences uh, that you guys um, anticipate? Or, or well, do you again, I think it's the, uh, you know, it's even like post Rodney King, you know, nobody believed the LAPD for years. I mean, you went to trial. I mean, it was much harder for a prosecutor if it was just the officer's word against your client. All of a sudden, you know, with the right jury, you know, they're going to question it. And I think that's, again, like I was saying earlier, you know, they've laid out the government investigators here a little bit. Um, and now it's going to be, I think, used by defense lawyers when talking to a jury. It's not such a crazy argument you know, before, you know, that these, maybe there's some conspiracy, maybe someone's, you know, making this up, they're not telling the truth, you know, that now there's, there's going to be a portion of the jury pool that's going to believe that. Um, I've been selecting juries for 25 years, and I can just tell you one of the first questions a judge asks a jury pool is, or, or instructs a jury pool is an officer should have the same weight and credibility assessment as any other witness. And so you always pose that question. You, you take that instruction. You ask the jury, do you guys accept that? Can you live with that as the law? And a lot of jurors will say, well, no, I think the police officers are more reliable and more credible. So then you can at, use this case as an example in other cases uh, and probe your jury pool of what they actually believe of officers. Because depending on which courthouse you're in, if you're in Los Angeles, you're trying state cases, you may get one type of jury. 
a downtown on 210 West Temple and a whole different type of jury at the LAX courthouse or at the Long Beach courthouse. So it is a very relevant question to ask your jury pool. And I agree with you, Michael, uh, when the president um, is questioning all of the FBI and is saying the FBI is corrupt because he's made statements against Comey and against uh, the FBI in general, it definitely puts a question in the public's mind of how reliable are federal law enforcement officials. What do you think? I Go ahead. add a point uh, to that uh, about the credibility of law enforcement. When I was in AUSA, even in my time in the office, I saw uh, a change, maybe it was my own experience, but a change in perception an increase in skepticism, perhaps, on the part of some jurors that the badge didn't shine quite as brightly as it might have in the past. I had a jury uh, come back. It was uh, one of the only times there was ever a not guilty, and that was because there was a statement made by the defendant that law enforcement um, had, had written a report, the agent testified, um, and ultimately there was a not guilty. And we talked to the jury and we asked why, and they said, well, you know, we think that uh, the agents are nice people, but why didn't they tape record it? Why, didn't, why couldn't we hear the words of the defendant? And we felt that we just couldn't convict someone without a recording. And it's been interesting. In the last three or four years, I've noticed, uh, a, I don't know if it's a, it used to be that there was a general policy by the FBI that subject interviews, uh, in custody subject interviews would all, all, always be recorded. Now I'm seeing more and more uh, uh, practices by AUSAs, even in our district, that they'll want to record subject interviews. Uh, of course, as a defense attorney, that, that makes me nervous. It's a practice that uh, I think can cut both ways. But I think law enforcement is even responding now to the reality that uh, juries would like to see some corroboration to what the uh, officer might be testifying to. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad. I do think recent statements made by senior elected officials at the federal level um, cast out and, and I think negatively impact uh, the public's perception of the justice system. And I think that's unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, I think that the court system is the last bastion of credibility. And that's why it's so important, you know, that we maintain a credible system. And that's why I don't fault Judge Sullivan for at least trying to get to the facts. I may not agree with how we might rule. I don't know how the case will wind up, but he appears to be fact finding. Um, under Rule 48A, which does provide for leave of court. Professor so. Levinson, did you have, want to add something? Yeah, what I want to add here is that there are other dimensions of this, which is, let's say that there is a prosecution and they make a motion for leave of court and the judge says no. There's still another way for the executive branch to remedy what they think might be an injustice i.e. they can pardon, they can commute. That's what the president's power is. What the fight is right now is what does it mean for the bench to be taking guilty pleas? Because we don't want to make that pro forma. We want that to be really important so that the judges pay attention. Don't forget, we have had scandals where the judges have not paid attention, like Rampart. And we had a lot of innocent people plead guilty. So you want the judges to be invested in that we did it right, we got the right guilty plea. And if you make the standard too easy to say, no, you get to withdraw or dismiss a case, then what, that, what is the message to judges in taking guilty pleas? I want to just point out one other case that we talked about prepping for this is the Orange County case that's going on right now, which is the uh, Dr. Uh, Rubichow. And I don't know if everyone's familiar with it. This is a a TV doctor. He was very well known on from reality TV. And in 2016, they started an investigation that he was drugging him and his girlfriend, these two. Hey, Lori, you're not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> these two were going to bars, meeting women, drugging them, taking them back, and then raping them. Um, 2016, 2017, investigation, investigation. Next thing you know, Tony Rakakis, the DA, um, is in a very difficult race against Todd Spitzer, and he indicts or, or charges them and goes and arrests them, a big press conference. And uh, Spitzer immediately accuses Rakakis of this is political, you're doing this to try to win the wet race. Fast forward now, they are charged. Spitzer is now the district attorney. There's no guilty plea yet. And he files a motion to dismiss, saying, you know, we had a rogue investigator who was leading these um, uh, victims down a path. They really aren't credible. 
and they file this motion to dismiss. Well, Judge uh, Gregory Jones in Orange County says, hold up, I'm not, I'm not buying this. I want to hear more. He gets briefs from the victim's lawyers in court. Um, he asked the DA to do a better response, and they end up filing a 25, 20 something page brief on what the problems with the case are. Obviously, the defense is saying, you know, dismiss it. It's, there's, you know, not enough evidence. And he did a 25 page ruling denying the dismissal. Um, but and basically, is, is, is he said the, things like, it's hard for this court to understand how Mr. Spitzer and his deputies can reject the allegations of seven women they have never met and interviewed. Um, he also said, you know, he talked about the war between the current and former DA overshadow an objective review of the case. Um, he said the public has heard from the politicians. The public has never heard from the alleged victims. Any objective analysis of this case leads to the conclusion that these charges should be put before a jury, a backroom dismissal by prosecutors without the alleged victims ever having the opportunity to be heard is contrary to the core values of our legal process and the interest of the public. Hey, Richard, now, can I just, me, isn't the difference is there's no guilty plea and that's more a separation it's, of powers issue? Because the, the judge is saying, I'm going to step on the, on the role of the DA and say, I want the evidence to be heard in court. And there hasn't been a guilty plea. So isn't that more of a separation of powers problem? It is, but I think what he, you know, what happened on this, early on, Spitzer did try to refer the case to the AG's office and they declined it. Now, I think the judge is going to refer it to the, I think he's going to, rec what I anticipate is he's going to recuse the DA's office, say there's a conflict and ask the AG to review it. But again, it kind of goes, what's the end game? And I think, you know, when Lori made the point, even if we watch Flynn and let's say he gets sentenced, the end game is, you know, is there going to be a pardon? You know, and the same thing is who's going to prosecute these two people if the DA says they're not, and if the AG says we're not going to take the case, that's it. Vince, if, if Flynn hadn't pled guilty, okay, hadn't pled guilty and the government makes a motion to dismiss, I just don't see that as much of an issue as what we have here, which is Flynn has pled guilty twice, right? Yeah, I think that his guilty plea twice is uh, a very material circumstance and it creates this very, I think, unprecedented posture. And I do find it interesting. I skimmed the, the, the brief that Flynn filed today in comparing and contrasting Gleason's analysis of the court's authority under 18 U.S.C. 401 and um, uh, Criminal Procedure Rule 42 and the court's inherent ability to bring contempt charges versus Flynn's view of the world, which is, look, you know, Rule 11 allows you to withdraw a guilty plea so you can never per se, um, obstruct the legal process. It's just, to me, it's that aspect of this case is fascinating as, 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 as well. Uh, I think Rick had mentioned the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. They did file an amicus brief with the DC Circuit that I thought was very interesting because without, they didn't get into the, the Flynn uh, statements that he made under oath and they didn't get, you know, granular and trying to figure out, you know, coming down on one side or the other, but they did uh, brief the Alford case, which is the genesis of a no contest plea, the Alford plea, uh, and made the point that Alford, uh, the Supreme Court said, look, a person can intelligently conclude that their interests require the entry of a guilty plea, even if they, we, even if they believe that they're innocent. So this question of whether Flynn should be held in a contempt I mean, uh, Gleason has concluded that shouldn't hold him in contempt, Your Honor, but it should, you should think about it when you're sentencing him if you don't withdraw the guilty, if you don't let him withdraw the guilty plea is interesting. But the fact that he pled guilty is a really, really material difference in some other cases. But I do find the debate uh, about whether he should be held in contempt, whether it's perjury or not, is very interesting. And I felt that the criminal defense uh, lawyer's amicus brief was interesting. I'm interested in knowing Professor Levinson's view and how she weighs the case on perjury, not perjury, contempt, not contempt. And is it so fact specific that there really is no rule that we could pull out of this case? 
I'm not sure it's so fact specific that we won't eventually get to it. Right now, it is quite different because of the facts of this case. You know, I think one of the reasons that Judge Sullivan put perjury out there in contempt is that that is the power, as been said, that for him to investigate and appoint, he can appoint somebody outside of the Justice Department to prosecute the contempt. So I don't think it was so much because he actually wants to hold Flynn in contempt. I think it's more so that he could have a voice since the Justice Department is not voicing those points at all. And um, I do agree that Judge Gleason had a very reasonable response, which is you don't really need to hold him in contempt. You do have the ability to consider it at the time of sentencing. Uh, what's also interesting is procedurally. Uh, Flynn's lawyers, when they rushed up on the mandamus petition to the D.C. Circuit, didn't make any comments about the contempt proceedings, although they objected to having Gleason as an amicus curiae. And so during the argument that came up with, how do you want us to deal with this? You're not only asking for something extraordinary, a mandamus remedy, you want a partial mandamus remedy. Everything's out of the ordinary. And I'll tell you, the one thing we heard from those judges, liberal or conservative, was can we get justice back on a normal track. I think people are pretty exhausted by treating cases outside of the regular procedure that we have for these cases. I think that we have so many cases that go through our state and federal system every day. And I think I'm sure most people that are listening in that work in the criminal defense or prosecution arena know that this is just an outlier. And at most of the cases, you know, they're just dealt with in a regular fashion. We don't have these issues. And people that enter police typically don't you know, take away their pleas, and then the government doesn't come in and dismiss cases after pleas are entered. So this is a very unusual situation, and it's great to look at it because it raises these very uh, unusual separation of powers arguments, uh, but it's not the way most, most cases work, right, Richard? I mean, have you ever seen anything like this in court? Is the, how do courts usually deal with their cases? I mean, I, I don't think so, but, you know, the, the interesting part, reading, like, the colloquy of the, the second plea, I mean, the, you know, the judge was doing his best saying, you know, I don't, I, I don't take pleas from guilty people that are saying they're not guilty and I don't intend to start today. I want to be sure because some of the filings were questioning his guilt. And so, I mean, he just went through one of those complicated pleas and just said, are you sure? You know, like he, he kind of saw this coming and really covered himself on the second plea. And here we are. I mean, hey. it's, it's, it's extremely unusual. I have a question for the panel. One of the things the government dropped was not going after his son, and he's allowed to, well, in this case, I guess it's not just withdrawing the plea. They're asking for a full dismissal. But technically, I mean, they were going to charge his son as well, right? That was one of the, he, it seems like the son, the partner in his business was under investigation as well. And that was part of his calculus of entering the plea. That's just what the press reported. Um, do defendants oftentimes consider collateral consequences like that before actually take a guilty plea. Vince? Yes. I mean, there are situations where I think it's sometimes referred to as kind of a package deal. Look, we're looking at you, we're looking at your, your spouse, your kids. Um, you know, we'll exercise our discretion to uh, not charge them. It, I mean, it certainly can be, it's certainly not unprecedented for a defendant to consider the fact that the government's investigating affiliates and family members uh, and decide to take a plea uh, in part because they want to protect others. It's not unprecedented. Uh, you know, it really comes down to the circumstance of the case. Of course, on the side of the prosecution, they have to be mindful uh, to be ethical and how they wield that, uh, that uh, uh, authority and, uh, and can engage in some sort of illegal squeeze play. I mean, obviously, everybody has to be, every case and every investigation sort of stands on its own two feet, at least in theory. And, and, and I want to say, because I saw a chat question from Angela, which is, if we think honestly about our plea program, whether it's federal or state court, there's tremendous pressure on defendants, not just from the prosecution to plead guilty, but from their own lawyers sometimes. They just think that in the end, you're going to come out with closer to what you want. And so that factual basis isn't always the most honest thing about the case. I actually don't think that's the case here. I, I, I think the factual basis was examined and re-examined and re-examined. But to the extent that we're looking systemically at this issue, it is a fair criticism 
that we have not been candid enough in how we deal with the factual basis. I think one of the questions I have from uh, our attendees is do people, you know, are innocent defendants entering pleas and um, is that a problem in the, you know, in our system where folks, and I know Richard brought it up before, where people say sitting in custody may take a deal and agree to something to a plea just to get out of custody, but really are innocent. Um, I know I try to really have long-term, long discussions with my clients, sometimes with my partner and my associate present, so that multiple people are talking to the client to make sure the client and our firm understands what it is they want to do, whether they want to answer the guilty plea, whether or not, in fact, they're guilty. But do you guys think there's a systemic problem of innocent people accepting responsibility and then perhaps because they want to get out of custody and, and, um, and then later saying, hey, we didn't do this, we shouldn't have been found guilty by the court, Vince or Lori or Richard? Yeah, I, I, I'd say there's something, and I was reading this in prepping, called the Innocent Defendant's Dilemma. And there's a, something called the Plea Bargain Blog, and there's a professor, Lucien Durvan, he used to be chair of the ABA Criminal Justice Section, I think, last year at Belmont University. And he's does a lot on that, writes on it. They did a study with a bunch of students, and they basically, they, they, they put the students in for a test, and half the students cheated and half didn't. They accused them all of cheating. And basically what happened was they told the students, you know, you've been caught cheating, and they knew the ones that were innocent. And they said, you have a choice. You can go before an academic panel, but if you go before the academic panel, just letting you know, 80 to 90% of the time, we find people guilty, but we're offering you a really lenient sentence here. Um, or, you know, you can take it all the way. 56% of the innocent people took the plea offer. And these are college students, you know, you're thinking you're going to get kicked out of school. So, I mean, yes, I mean, we can't ignore the fact, I think, that, that innocent people will, you know, weigh their options and they are going to plead guilty. And, well, and in that regard, I think we should think about the most vulnerable. Um, and again, going back to the Rampart scandal, you need to know that 100 people were convicted, most overwhelmingly, on guilty pleas because they felt like, who's going to believe me? Not only my, my own lawyer doesn't believe me. Everybody on the bench is so jaded they don't believe me. And the courts weren't even taking full factual basis. They basically said to both sides, is there a back factual basis? People said yes, and off we went, convicting people who are not overly educated, don't have the resources. This is one of those systemic problems that really deserves examination. I, I saw a question, if I could, Dimitri, about the uh, Varsity Blues case, and I didn't know if we were going to be asked to weigh in very quickly on that. Um, so let me know. Can I, can I just say one thing, Lori, on your point about Rampart? That's the difference between the state and the federal system in that, unfortunately, in the state system, there's not much discussion about factual basis. You just stipulate to a factual basis, the defense lawyer, the prosecutor, and there's not much colloquy between the defendant and the court. Richard talked about that earlier to make sure the judge feels the defendant is actually guilty, the defendant believes he's actually guilty. In federal court with Flynn, there was so much more time spent on the factual basis where there was a, an, ex, an extensive discussion between the, the judge and Flynn where it clearly documented Flynn accepting responsibility. But to your point, uh, Professor Levinson, in state court, it's so much faster. So you have the problem of Rampart where people are entering these quick pleas with stipulations by their defense counsel and the defendants really don't have a chance to talk much. So that's just a state court endemic issue. Uh, but yeah, let's talk about var Varsity Blues. Uh, uh, w w the, Professor Levinson, do you have any comments on that on that situation? I know, well, I know Richard yeah. knows the case well. Well, and, and Richard, you should chime in. Uh, I'll be very brief. It I'll does, probably it, stay out of it because we represent one of the defendants. Uh, right okay, there. but it does strike me that there was a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure on the parents in this case just by you know what kind of sentences they faced, how it disruptive it was to their family. What I found was fascinating that the one defendant is sort of pushing back and trying to go at the government was actually to get able to get one of the better deals. So this whole plea bargaining dance, if you want to say, seems somewhat unrelated to the underlying conduct and the truth and a lot related to how far you can push the other side with a 
the consequences, the consequences of what's going to happen. And I also think in high profile cases, again, they're not exemplary usually of how criminal matters are handled day to day in state and federal court. Whenever you have a high profile aspect, everyone acts differently. The prosecutors act differently, the judges, uh, especially if there are cameras in court. So uh, most defendants are, you know, for for us to look at Flynn or the Varsity Blues case and say, hey, this is how 99, this is how the entire criminal justice system works. It's not really exemplary. They're unique and unusual cases because they're high profile. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate that the public gets perception of the criminal justice system being so perhaps unfair or um, targeting specific people unfairly. It, it's it, it's not indicative of again ninety nine percent of the of the way the system works. Vince, do you have any input on the Varsity Blues case at all? I'm not able to really comment on that case, but I'll make the general point. I, I agree with your point that high profile cases um, aren't representative of most of the cases in the system, but it is the high profile cases that set the tone. So I think about, for example, this the case involving Senator Ted Stevens. Uh, which had a very tragic outcome for all considering. Um, and it does make me wonder, and I just throw this out there, and you know, reviewing some of the materials that Michael had circulated in preparing for the panel, uh, looking at some of the policy recommendations that were made by a few of the commentators, you know, given that we have the case of the United States versus Ruiz, uh, should the Congress consider a statute? Uh, passing a law uh, requiring mandatory pre-plea disclosure of Brady evidence? Is that something the Congress should be doing? Right. And also, secondly, a plea integrity unit within the Department of Justice. Is there a proper role for that? I don't know what the answer is, but I put those out there. Well, Vince, I think that's a, a very interesting idea, but I want to just sort of edge in here and say, you know, under the new ethical rules for the California State Bar, there probably is a duty you know, to be disclosing exculpatory evidence at every stage. And so there's a conflict right now between your constitutional duty and your ethical duty. And that, and that was passed just a few years ago, right? That, right. That, mm. that became effective about two years ago. I think one of the things that we're seeing, too, just as a, as a guy who reads a newspaper on a pretty regular basis, is um, there are a lot more creative charge there, there are a lot, a lot of these cases involve creative uses of the statutes so for example varsity blues um you know what what actually is the crime there in you know paying a donation to a school that, that so your kid will get in i mean isn't that the way that the system works and then even uh more clearer i guess case if you uh were to ask uh, the u.s supreme court is bridgegate right where the they were trying to fit honest services on these people who were closing exits off the George Washington Bridge and make that into a crime. And the Supreme Court said, no, that's, yeah, it's bad, but it's not a crime. Um, so a lot of those cases that, that we're seeing, I think, um, are, uh, you know, maybe the effect of trying to turn bad acts into things that you can prosecute criminally. I know, I, I know Rick agrees with that because he actually sent me that comment to make. So. Well, <laughs> the bridge gate's gonna uh, linger into Varsity Blues. Uh, July 1, oral arguments. All right. Hey, Michael, when is, are we, are we stopping at exactly 4.30? Do we, do we wanna do some concluding remarks perhaps? Sure. All right, sure. Uh, Vince, Professor Levinson, Richard, and then I'll go. For Vince, concluding remarks about these cases at all? I think that you know, it is a very, very unprecedented case. I think it uh, creates a lot of food for thought. As a defense attorney, for me, uh, the implications are I'm going to have to be much more, I think, aggressive in requesting this sort of discovery. Um, I will be interested to see if the Department of Justice views this as a change in policy. But even if it's not, um, I'm going to be moving in that direction because I think now we see that it's probably really the ethical responsibility of defense counsel, certainly in cases involving false statements, to consider pursuing that. I do think it's an interesting uh, jumping off point for some possible policy changes, and I think that would be an interesting discussion. I don't know whether a plea integrity unit's a good idea or a bad idea, but I'd like to talk some more about that. And then lastly, on a personal note, it's a distinct privilege for me to be on this virtual stage with Professor Levinson who was my professor when I was a student at Loyola 
and I'm extremely grateful that she allowed me to share the stage with her. So thank you for that. Professor Levinson, concluding remarks? Well, I just want to say how lucky I am. I am honored to be with Vince and the rest of you for this program. Um, you know, right now, folks, the entire justice system is under a microscope. The public is paying attention. So thank you all, because I know you day in and day out are fighting the good fight and doing so ethically, and it's never been more important. Thank you. Richard? Just I would say thank you to everyone also. And, you know, I, I think it does, as you say, puts our day-to-day -day, uh, fights and turmoil that we do every day. You know, the public is watching and we have to do better. Yeah. Well, guys, thank you, everyone, for joining all our attendees to, you know, to, to the Beverly Hills Bar event. I appreciate everyone. I think it was a great discussion. Thank you again. And, and Michael, concluding remarks? Well, I just want to thank the people who showed up, uh, all of our attendees. I hope that they uh, enjoyed the presentation. I hope that they agree with me now, having listened to the presenters that the Beverly Hills Bar folks are some of the smartest uh, and most experienced experts that you can find. Um, so please join if you're not a member. Whether you're a member or not, please look for more of these panels, um, and I hope to see you soon. Thanks. All right, guys. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Great evening. Take care. Thank you. Thanks.